our topic for today is wait lang that's it the old english literature so mom already gave the basic concepts of literature so i know everyone um can no longer need to discuss what is literature mean so today okay man they man lag ang ano ang presentation is it clear may baga man may yellow lang oh si 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 ulit ulit dili pa na play um, sharing naman siya. Ay naman. Ah, ayan. Okay. Okay na. <clears throat> Ba't ang bilis nang... Okay. Now, can you see something? Yes, mm -hmm. go now. Okay, so, again, today we are going to discuss about Old English Literature or the Anglo-Saxon period dated back 449 BC to 1066 AD or Anadomini. Okay, so but before that, let me share to you the learning objectives for that we have a guide for today's discussion. So the first one is to trace the timeline history of the Anglo-Saxon period. Since we know that um, you can determine the history in literature and it is a part of literature. And then the second one is discuss some important literary works of old English literature and then cite some important writers of old English literature. Now, here are our group. Yeah. So for today's facilitators, I am Marlene Joy Bulalin and here with me, Irish Mary Romero, Levi Prundoso, Jean Gaspar, and Crystal Elamari Oliete. So we are your facilitator for today's discussion. But before we shall start to... But before we shall start to... Um, formal discussion of the old english literature let me share to you this um the storyboard which is consists of events and these events are known as the british um british events or the history this is a timeline timeline so that we can we can all have a guide to know their culture uh, to know their literature since like Mom said last time, um, a while ago, that literature, if you want to know the culture, the tradition that is um, that, the, um, that is inside the uh, specific country, just read literature and then you will have a free uh, journey or adventure. So here, you can see here, the Stonehenge. So I know every one of you is familiar of the Stonehenge, and this is one of the seven wonders of the world that can be only found in England. And then here, just look at the picture, and there is a um, what they got um, description about that, and also the date. So, yeah. so that is the rise of the old English literature. So that time, di pa naman tayo na buhay. So we need to um, have an overview, overview of their history. Yeah. 
So just a quick glance. Yan. And I hope you can also take screenshots of this for reference. And that's it. So the old English literature has ended during 1066 AD or when Norman de Saxons, William the Conqueror became the king of England. And then after that, the next period now, which is the medieval period. But today, we are just going to focus on the old English literature. So for that, Let's have the first formal discussion with Irish Marie Romero, which is she will discuss the Britain before the Anglo Saxons and to the Roman occupation. Irish, are you there? Mm. Okay, wait now, stop for Okay. Now, can you see something on your screen? Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay, Rich. Maya, wag ka, Merle. Maya, mayroon. Good. Meron na po. <laughs> okay, na. okay na, Merle. Yes. Okay, so to begin with, good afternoon everyone. I am Irish Marie A. Romero, a member of Group 1, and today we will be discussing about the overview of periods of early English history, prehistory, 1066 AD. Next book. Next, Merle. Okay, so the assigned topic to me was Britain before the Anglo-Saxons and the Roman occupation. Proceed. So first, let's take a look at Britain before the Anglo-Saxons. Back, back. The last and by far the most important of the early conquerors were the Celts, people from Southern Europe who had gradually migrated west between 800 and 600 BC. Two groups of Celts invaded the British Isles. One group, who called themselves Britons, now spelled Britons with I, settled on the largest island, Britain. The other, known as Gaels, settled on the second largest island known to us as Ireland. Number three, Gaels and Britons spoke different but related languages of the Celtic family. Celtic languages had nothing in common with the Germ Germanic ones later associated with the Anglo-Saxons. The Celts were warlike people who organized their society into clans. Gaels and Britons were farmers and hunters, and each with a fearsome loyalty to its chief chieftain. chieftain. So, to further discuss all about the Celtics, so the British islands were inhabited by Celtic people known as the Britons. Ang Britons po are warlike people and when they argue, they often look to a class of priests known as Druids. So the Druids po are group of priests in an ancient British religion. Ang duty po nila is to recite um, long heroic poems that um, preserves people's myths about the past. Um, they have different lit rituals po and they have um, a huge belief with regards mythology, traditions, practices, and customs. So, yun po ang Celtics. Um, some of the poems that, um, they, the, that the Druids um, includes was fables, such as the leader of King Cole, and even the nursery rhyme. And also it includes yung work ni Shakespeare na tragic play yeah tragic play which was entitled king lear king Le yeah king lear po 
So, during those times, um, the Roman Empire made um, initial contacts now with the Celtic people around 55 BC. So, the Roman invasion of Britain began. So, after ng long reign of Celtic sa Britain, dumating na rin yung Roman invasion and this and something huge really happened that the queen, that the Celtic queen, the Roman Celtic queen, have um, encountered and been in a situation wherein sobrang naipit ang the Celtics when the Roman tro troops arrived. And the Celtic queen was named um, Bodica. Ang, ang husband niya is, used to be a Roman ally. However, when it died, kinuha ng Roman troops yung chance to took the to take their ano to take their land and the Celtics considers um they allotted women rights um often equal to men they are fair when it comes to power and um even women that time can rule fair treatment between men and women kaso lang nga nung namatay yung husband ni Queen Baudica um yun na nga, tinake opportunity ng Roman troops and even they flog Brodica and nirape yung mga anak nila. And however, during that time, si Brodica led her people in revolt and for some time, na-manage nilang i-hold yung mighty Roman League legions. But then, hindi pa rin naawat yung Romans at tumagal nga is dumating na pa din sa Roman occupation. So yun po. Next po. So now let's proceed to the important events during Roman occupation. So some of you might be wondering, um, what is the connection? Oh, how did the Roman invasion affect the development of um, English language? Well, well, the fact there is no direct linguistic connection. Po, ang Roman occupation lang, ang Roman occupation sa Britain, and all of it of our all of its subsequent abandonment. Um, set the stage for the most important invasion, which was to be dis which, which we will be discussing for today, yung Anglo Saxons, which provided a huge foundation of the English language and poetry. So yon. So first, Julius Caesar begins the invasion occupation in 55 BC. So I know that some of us, um, majority of us, are familiar of who is Julius Caesar or, or familiar sa atin. He was the one who wins the civil war and even establishes himself bilang dictator and the supreme ruler ng Rome. And siya yung nagput ng end sa Roman Republic. Um, if some of you might be wondering what was the cause of the civil war, it was about um, the different loyalties and beliefs of the people that causes to, for the transformation of the republic into an empire. So, yun. Next is the occupation completed by Claudius in 1st century AD. 1st century AD, Anno Domini. So, yun. Dito pa, rin, pa din yung tuloy-tuloy na pag reign ng um, Rome sa Britain. Sa, ng Roman sa Britain. Next is Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall that was built in 122 AD. Hadrian's Wall, um, when the Romans... Um, conquered the Britain around AD 44 yes AD 44 nagset sila ng fortresses ng mga lighthouses and yun nga mismo Hadrian Wall sa entire modern uh, entire northern northern border ng England and it was named after the Roman Emperor Hadrian itself so the um, if you're all familiar they are also even the one who built the Aquisolis, who is named now, who is known out now, who is known now as the Bath England. So yon, and they even built mosaics, villas, which is still um nage exist pa up to this very time. So next is Romans live in 14 AD because Visigoths attack Rome. So yan nasa next slide, and it's about how Roman was defeated, how the 
Romans was ano na na takpan na naman sila ng Visigoths. So next, Saint Augustine, the other Saint Augustine, lands in Kent in five five nine seven and converts King Adelbert, King of Kent, the oldest Saxon settlement to Christianity, becomes first Archbishop of Canterbury. So during um during Kent to Christianity about six hundred BC, um. There is still no evidence that the English, the, yes, that the English wrote poetry in their language. So, hindi pa dito masyadong binibigyan ng weight ang um, particular use ng um, right language when it comes to literature. However, during those time, during the Roman occupation, meron na namang Roman literature na nagbigin noong 3rd century, ana, around 3rd century BC. It even reaches the Golden Age. Um, during the reign pa din po ni Augustus and the early part of the Roman Empire, the Romans even wrote um, a lot of poetry, uh, history, um, for, formal speeches, po, and they even have already qualities when it comes to Roman literature. It like poignancy, dignity, gravity, rights, and also strengthening po and elevating yung characters for all classes of people. So, so yun, um, it's about um, how the Romans already started, how, it, uh, how, how literature already began during that time. Next po. So these are the important culture and historical results of the Roman occupation. So ito nga, military strong armed forces, the legions, pushed shelves into Wales and Ireland, prevented Vikings from raiding for several hundred years, Warren Halter, Hollister's writes, Rome's greatest gifts to Britain was peace. And for the infra infrastructure, government fell apart when they left, walls, villas, public baths, some remains still exist. So yun nga, like the... Hadrian's Wall, and even the Aquicellis. And next is language and writing. Latin was official language. Next is practice of recording history to le led to earliest English literature being documentary. And next is the Christianity beginning to take hold, especially after St. Augustine converts King Adelbert. So, yun nga, if this, the, the topic is just about how the how the invasion or how the, the occupation of Celtics and the Roman to Britain happened. So the next that will be discussed is Anglo-Saxon po by Miss Gaspar. That ends my report po. Thank you. So thank you so much, Miss Irish. Now, let us now move to Anglo-Saxon. After the Roman conquest, the next invaders were the Anglo-Saxons. But who were these ancient people? Some Anglo-Saxons appear to have been deep sea fishermen, already accustomed to marauding coasts along the Baltic Sea. Others seem to have been farmers, perhaps seeking soil richer than the sandy or marshy land at home. Ferocious as the Anglis and Saxons may have been, they did not perform their piracy merely for plunder, at least not for long. They sought and won territory, apparently by rowing their shallow boats upriver into the British. Heartland and then building camps and waging war on the Britons. Gradually, the newcomers gained the upper hand over the island settlers and look over more and more of what today is England. The first Angles, Saxons, and Jutes transferred to England. They're, they are highly organized tribal units. They are also called Germanic tribes. Each tribe was ruled by a king chosen by a witan or council of elders. Each community had four distinct classes. First is the earls, were a, a hereditary class of ruling warlords who owed their position to the king. The second class 
free men were allowed to own land and engage in commerce. Included Thames, early barons who were granted their status as a reward for military service. Next is the lower on the social scale were chairs or serfs, banded servants who work the land and return for military protection. And the lowest of all were trolls or slaves, usually military prisoners or people being pun punished. Invading groups set up numerous small kingdoms and at first the various kingdoms fought frequently. As time went, went on, however, many of these tribal differences faded. Anglo-Saxon kingdoms traded with one another. Men married women from different tribes. Kingdoms gradually absorbed one another until seven large ones remained. So the seven large kingdom of or also known as Anglo-Saxon Heptarchy, are the following. For the number one, we have Kent Essex, or the East Saxon. And number two, Sussex, South Saxon. Number three, East Four, Anglia. Five, Northumbria. Six, Mercia. And number seven, which is last, Wessex, or West Saxon. The Anglo Saxons brought to Britain their own pagan beliefs also, and the world of the sixth century, the ever present dangers of death by accident or warfare, had led these people to take a rather grim view of life. In fact, the early Anglo Saxons believed that every human life was in the hands of fate. Their attitude was sharply different from the Christian belief. In the freedom of an individual to determine his or her own path. So the early Anglo-Saxon worship ancient Germanic gods. They included Chu, god of war in the sky, Wooden, chief of the gods, and Freya, Wooden's wife and goddess of the home. These gods were abandoned with the coming of Christianity. Even so, their name survived in our in our words today, which is Tuesday. Wednesday and Friday. So that's all. Let us now move to Christianity and literature. And Miss Crystal Oyati would going to discuss it to you. That's all. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jean. I'll take that from here. So uh, the next report is about the coming of Christianity. Um, uh, from the book, po, it says that during the 4th century of Roman, uh, yeah, uh, the Roman accepted Christianity and introduced it to British. And, I mean, I mean Brit huh? Britain. And then from the internet, po, it says that Roman Empire permitted Christian worship from three, 313 Anno Domini onwards and then during the fourth century british christianity just then grew increasingly evident so um more and more british began accepting christianity as their religion but that time it did not won yet the hearts and minds of the population means pagan belief um yeah. Pagan beliefs still were prevalent while Christianity was only minority religion. Uh, the century, a century later, where Celts fled the Anglo-Saxon, they took their Christian faith with them. As you can see, po, when Anglo-Saxon arrived in Britain, they were pagans. But as time went on, po, they gradually converted to Christianity. That's the influence of Celts po, to Anglo-Saxons. During the period, during that period, the faith lived on in Wales. From there, it spread to Ireland, assisted by the activities of legendary Saint Patrick. Okay. 
So the missionary worked, uh, continued as St. Patrick assisted and played an important role to uh, in converting native Irish to Christianity. So this St. Patrick had been captured into slavery in Ireland. And following his escape and later um, consecration as bishop, then returned to the isle to bring the gospel. After Rome fell to barbarian tribes in Anno Domini 476, communication weakened between Romans and Celtic Christians. While Roman was recovering from political chaos, the Celtic Christian church continued to thrive. So the Huns from the east invaded the Goths, who subsequently invaded Roman Empire. Po. This was the cause of the fall of Rome. It is said that during the time, emperors were weak and military leaders fought among themselves. Rome was struggling under weight of its um, giant empire. In 563, a group of Irish monks set sail in a tiny, tiny skiffs for the west coast of uh, Scotland, led by the soldier and abbot named Columba. They established Christian monastery on the island of Iona. It says po, that St. Columba arrived with 12 companions at Iona, then built his first Celtic church, uh, and establish a monast monastic community. Columba and his monks then moved across northern Britain in the hope of winning additional souls for the faith in their travels. They won already acceptance among many Scots, among some Saxons and Angles. Their conversation led in turn the establishment of other monasteries in the north. He and his associates have been spreading Christianity to draw more worshippers. Many of these who accepted Christianity are some Scots and Angles and Saxons. So, as said, po, they again plan to talk about uh, constructing several additional monasteries in north. Then, next po. Uh, nakalagpas na po. Then we come now to the resurgence of Roman Church. Uh, meanwhile, the Roman Church has reorganized itself and begin to send missionaries throughout Europe. As of this point, many Catholics opted to devote their lives to the empowering in it in its development. And they went on to be missionaries. And their mission was to spread Catholic teaching across Europe and the world. Roman cleric St. Augustine, uh, not the early Christian church father, arrived in southern England and quickly converted King Ethelbert of Kent to Christianity. So this Ethelbert, King Ethelbert was the first king of England to become the Christian, uh, which is a tremendous achievement for the national identity of England. Augustine set up a moment monastery at Canterbury in Kent and began preaching his faith to other rulers in South England, southern England. So this man was sent from Rome to England to bring Christianity to Anglo-Saxons. Again, this topic is all about arrivals and um, spreading of Christianity in every country. So, yeah. He then eventually was the first bishop or archbishop of Canterbury, founded one of the main abbeys 
of medieval England and and um, did what his mission again to convert Christianity at Canterbury. So to win over a kingdom, Augustine and his followers needed only to convert the king who would then make Christianity the religion of his realm. Of course, the of course, <laughs> the easier way to convert the people um, of Canterbury as Christian as Christians is to convert first their leader, who will convince, control, and influence these people to become uh, one of his religion. By the year of 650, they indeed largely succeeded. Most England was Christian by the name, if not in fact. So we come now to Christianity and literature. The church also brought to England two elements of uh, civilization th that has missing since the departure of romance, which is education and written literature. Christian leaders uh, established schools at Canterbury and York and supervised the preservation of learning in Ireland's monastery. Within their secluded halls, monks often worked as scribes. Recording and duplicating manuscripts or books written by hands. At first, they worked only in Latin, the language of church scholarship. Often, several monks labored for years to compare, I'm sorry, to complete a single manuscript. These volumes were elaborately painted and illuminated in gold and silver. From such monas monastic training emerged a Northumbrian Nerth monk, later considered the father of English history. Today, we know him as Venerable Bede, 673 to 735. <laughs> Bede was a master of thorough research, tracking down information by studying earlier documents and interviewing people who had witnessed or taken part of in part in past events. His most famous volume was A History of the English Church and People, a monumental work that offers the clearest account we have of early Anglo-Saxon times now although christianity did indeed temper anglo-saxon civilization it did not destroy the north no, i mean the northerners spirit glimpse of an early world lived on a fragment of epic ethics such as beowulf a long narrative poem that depicted great battles between Anglo-Saxons, warriors, and superhuman monsters. The Anglo-Saxons remained a hardy group, fearless and loyal in their instincts, even if less and less predatory in their habits. Now, they were about to come face to face with new peril from a people much like themselves, invasion by the Vikings. That's all for. Next would be. Who is it? Would be Mr. Levy po. So good afternoon po. Siguro po, I will no longer open my camera because, ano po, konti na lang po ang data <laughs> natira. So, so, I will be reporting about the Danish, inv Danish invasion. So, there has been two. So, the Danish invaded 
Europe two times. So the, the ano, the, my report is composed of the first and the second Danish invasion. So please, next slide po. So the first Danish invasion, between the 8th and 12th centuries, a great restlessness overtook the region of Northern Europe known as Scandinavia. Beset with the rising population and limited farmland, the people of Norway, the Norse, and of Denmark, the Danes, followed old traditions and took to the seas. In some of their most adventurous voyages, the Vikings, or the warriors, carried their piracy to the British Isles. Isles. <laughs> the Norse set their sights on Nor Northumbria, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, whereas the Danes targeted eastern and southern England. So if you were one, if you're wondering about Vikings, although it was already um, it was already mentioned during our mythology class last um, first when we were in first year. Uh, <clears throat> ano, the Vikings are referred to the pirates, 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 and traders who raided and settled in many parts of North northwestern Europe. So yon. Next. <clears throat> so under the first Danish invasion, we have the Viking raids. Um, Viking invaders sacked and plundered monasteries, destroyed manuscripts, and stole sacred religious objects. So obviously, since Vikings are pirates, that's the usual habit that they are doing. They burned entire communities and put villagers to the sword. Wherever the Vikings went, the sight of their square sailed ship stirred specters of terror and destruction. One Anglo Saxon prayer of the day reflected the fear that the Danish pirates inspired from the fury of the Northmen, O Lord, deliver us. So, parang yang prayer po na yan, yan yung reflection ng situation po during that raid of the Vikings. So, next, ay, hindi pa pala. Although the English fought back brilliantly, the Danes made broad inroads. By the middle of the 9th century, most of northern, eastern, and central England had fallen to the invaders. They called their territory the Dane Law. Only the Saxon kingdom of Wessex managed to fight the Danes to a standstill. So, yun po, about the Viking raids. So, under the first Danish invasion, we will be meeting, uh, we, we will be introducing to you a persona named Alfred the Great. So next, ano po. So Alfred the Great, in 18, 871, a king ascended to the Wessex throne who would become the only ruler in England's history ever to be honored with the epithet, the Great. So Alfred the Great, parang sa... Ano po na yun, episode po na yun na The Great, parang ka-level niya po si Alexander the Great ng Greece. His name was Alfred and he earned the title partly by resisting further Danish encroachment. Under a truce concluded in 886, England was formally divided. The Saxons acknowledged Danish rule in the east and north, but the Danes agreed to respect Saxon rule in the south. So parang baliktaran po sila. So the Saxon acknowledged Danish rule in the east and north. Pero yung mga Danes naman po agreed to respect the Saxon rule in the south. So as the king of a much expander, expanded Wessex, Alfred the Great became a national hero. So just a little recap po. Alfred the Great, um, the only ruler in England's history to be honored with the epithet the Great, and he became a national hero. So Alfred's achievement went far beyond the field of battle. However, uh, not only was he instrumental in preserving the remnants of pre-Danish, ay, next pala po, pre-Danish invasion uh, in Britain, but he encouraged a rebirth of learning and education. So here's the another uh, parang contribution po ni Alfred the Great. Parang hindi lang po siya naging ruler in terms of war, in terms of um, physical force, but he also uh, 
encourage the rebirth of learning and education. To make literature and other documents more readily available, he himself translated Bedes, History, and other works from Latin into Anglo-Saxon, the everyday language of the people. So, so na mention ako kanina si Bedes, he's a writer and marami po siyang mga writings about history, about Anglo-Saxon history, about the language, and yun. So, translate po yun ni, <clears throat> ni Alfred the Great um, into Anglo-Saxon. So, para po hindi tayo malito, Anglo-Saxon is another term for Old English. So, yun po. Um, he also began to keep records of English history and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle today among our principal sources of information in early English life. So, next is the Danish contribution. Danish contribution. Yeah. Gradually, the Danes became more peaceful and all animos, animosities subsided. A once war obsessed people settled into the work-a-day world of learning, beer brewing, and moving goods to market. Even before their arrival in England, many Danes had been accused accustomed to the merchant's trade. However, crudely, it may have existed in Northern Europe at the time. Now they built their Dane law communities not only as military fortresses, but as trading centers, and one result was the growth of English towns. So yun po, parang as Danes arrived, um, there has been a leeway to um, to transform a war one a war obsessed people into a work a day world of farming beer brewing and moving goods or in other words merchant trade and it is and the next end point of this is the building of english towns construction of english towns for um in the term construction parang nagkaroon po ng mga english towns because from the day to day um, interaction of people, of English people, so yun, parang na influence na influensyahan po ang Scandinavian ng Anglo-Saxon language. So, <clears throat> like the Anglo-Saxons, the Danes spoke a Germanic language, so they were able to communicate, communicate easily with the English. In fact, many Norse words are slowly crept into the English vocabulary. So here's another, ano po, here's another effect na many Norse words slowly crept into the English vocabulary. The word law is Danish, for example. I, the word law is Danish, for example. Its use reflected the Danes' interest in legal procedures. So parang isang trivia po ito na a law, word na law is I came from a Danish language because it reflects the Danes' interest in legal procedures. So as we all know, um, a law is about putting legal ev evidences so that it can be used as, uh, as <clears throat> a defense to promote justice. So we are done with... Uh, First Danish invasion. Let's proceed to the second Danish invasion and the Norman conquest. Conquest. The peace and stability that began with Alfred's reign lasted more than a century. Immigration for, from Scandinavia, Scandinavia dwindled, and the descendants of Alfred the Great were able to regain much conquered territory. Toward the close of the 10th century, however, a new series of onslaughts began as more Danes from Europe attempted to recapture and widen the Dane law. So the Dane law is the town um, or community. Once they had succeeded, they forced the Saxon with that to select a succession of Danish kings. So <clears throat> Edward next is the Edward the Confessor and the Normans. Um, Edward the Confessor and the Normans. Then, I next slide po. Then, 
In 1042, the line of succession returned to a descendant of Alfred the Great. So, C. Edward Po is the descendant of Alfred the Great. This king, Edward, had gained the, little, the title, the confessor, because he was a deeply religious Christian. So, kung si Alfred uh, was given the title, the Great, so, si Edward naman po na parang naging successor ni ano ni Alfred was has gained the title the confessor because of his deep re, uh, ano, religiosity and Christian faith. He had spent many of his early years in Normandy, a region once settled by Scandinavians and now a part of France. So Norman on his Norman on his mother's side. So sa mother's side po ni Edward, ang mother po ni Edward is Norman. Edward had developed a close friendship with his cousin, William, Norman, this ruler. So parang, ano, since pinsan niya po yon sa side ng mama niya, parang nagkaroon po ng close relationship si Edward kay William. And William is the Norman, this ruler. Parang siya po yung namumuno sa Normandy. Once Edward took the English throne, his association with the Normans further weakened Saxon power. His death in 1066 led directly to a Norman conquest of England and brought the end of the Anglo-Saxon period of literature, as we shall see. Ah, so we will see it in the next unit. So at the death of, um, after the death of Edward, it followed the end of the Anglo-Saxon period of literature. So it will be further discussed by the next discussant, Miss Bulalin. So thank you for. Okay, thank you. And I know that you have um, a little bit confusion regarding with the history since, but it is important, you know, that to, um, to have an overview about the history when we are going to study about the literature. Now that we're done with, I know, with ding, parang ding the past, um, with the timeline, now let's, go on or let's proceed on the anglo-saxon literature so how does this invasion how does this um lots of events that happen affect or I know, create a change or impact to the um literature to the english literature so it is now let's come to the anglo-saxon literature so here now I know that you can use the um, the prior knowledge that you gain from our um, former uh, yung mga, um, the first reporters or my group mates in order to understand this um, the Anglo-Saxon literature. So according to the scholars, they believe that the literature of the British Isles began with the Celtic droids. So if you are going to if you can still remember my one of my group mates. Um, especially Irish, um, he he um, discussed about this Celtic droid. So this Celtic droid is the priest assumed the function of storytellers, memorizing and reciting long heroic poems about Celtic leader li li leaders their deeds. So um, since it is from the ancient, also from the past, that we know that you. Some literature, um, the literature is only passed orally. Yes, I know that you are also, if you can um, relate this li English literature to Philippine literature, our Philippine literature also, um, start with oral tradition literature. So that's it. Now, the Anglo-Saxon literature began with spoken verse. Ito na yung sinabi ko. And incantations with the purpose to pass the tribal history and values to the audience that could not read. Yan. So, kumbaga, yung mga phrase sila yung mga, um, um, let's say, maraming alam. So, if we, we can, um, if we can uh, compare, um, yeah, compare this to our um, literature so that we can able to understand it um, better, para sila yung mga babaylan. 
that they le- they read the um incantations or the sing songs that it's and then runes it is the runes are uh, runes it is the device alphabet of letters so what are the runes so <clears throat> it is the for um runes is the alphabet used until the latin alphabet we have today so but ah bago nagkaroon ng ano ng improvement sa um writings system non the runes is the ancient writing systems of the anglo-saxons or the old english people or the ancient people of english now here i have here an illustrated illustration so that you can imagine ito po yung eh, ay, pala nag, ah, ano? okay na can you see can you see a pictures of a uh, celtic droids and a ruins hello yes po okay so here this is a, an example, um, illustration of a Celtic droids or um, a priest. So if you can, if you are, um, um, like, if you see movies like King Arthur, there are so many, um, and then there are so many characters that like Celtic droids. For example, yung ano nga, yung kapangalan ko pa Marlin so yon and then this one on the right side it is um Arun so noon wala pa ng ano yung wala pang um let's say proper paper para ilimbag or if pr- to print the literature the runes is um rocks is used to be um, their um, instrument para sulatan. Now, next. Here. So, when this, um, when did this reciting poems occur? And then, who are those who perform this poems or reciting poems so in the Ax- uh, anglo-saxon history uh, story we are familiar so with the battle with the with the armies um just like other reporters um describe their culture their life uh, their lifestyle which is more on war so that is that is why you mga reciting poems occurred on ceremonial occasions such as celebration of military victory, and then scops is the profession uh, is it is the term called to the professional minstrels who led the performance, and yung mga assistant performers ni naman are the gleemen. And then reciting of poems took place to the accompaniment of harp. It was recited for hours and in some instances even for days. So ganun ka tagal. And then and then how can we um how can we describe the Anglo the form or the formula of poem during the Anglo Saxon literature? So according to my sources, the the old lit- English literature was a formal, rigid pattern of word stresses give the lyrics a terse. Um, it is a sing-song effect, and there is a cesara or a midline pause occurred in many lines. And one of the formula or um, fig- um, um, a forg- um, ano, basta. Alliteration, it is the repetition of sounds, especially especially in initial consonants. So, ano lang, parang, kung compare mo yung old literature sa middle age, yung panahon na, na Shakespeare, mas, ma, mas ma, medyo, mas, ano na yun, mas complex kumpara sa Anglo-Saxon literature. Kasi yung poem nila is just a formal or rigid pattern. 
So I have here an illustration of the scops. Uh, yeah, the scops and the gleeman performing a poem or sing song a lyrical poem. So that is for your so my imagine you. Now only about 30 lines of Anglo-Saxon verse still exist. So like I said, there is no um, proper print, ano, printing kang ano nila, or published of their literature because it was um, orally performed. So 30,000 lines lang yung until now still exist and almost all of it is found in four works dating from about AD 975 to 1050. Now, what are the types of Anglo-Saxon verse? So like I said, the literature is always um, relate, uh, related to their culture, to their tradition, to their lifestyle. And since nung panahon na yun, more on butters, more on invasions, more on tribe, tribes war, so their Anglo-Saxon verse or their poem is their types of their Anglo-Saxon verse is heroic verse and elegiac verse. So when I say heroic, it is a recount the achievements of warriors involved in great battles. And then elegiac, it is the sorrowful laments that mourn death of loved ones and the loss of the past. Now, copied many years ago, the poem had undergone changes. Of course, there will, as I might not translate, then the the Anglo-Saxon late um that day it was um some of them the literature is written in Latin. That's why my mga translator and then it undergone a lot of changes. And later scops may have adapted them and so many have monastic scribes. However, however, the we cannot um um we cannot Um, uh, uh, we cannot change or we cannot the, the elements of Anglo-Saxon literature. So if you still remember, one of my group mates um, discussed about the pagan beliefs. So their pagan beliefs before the invasion, the, yeah, invasion of Christianity. So their pagan beliefs, um, yung pinaka main point nila doon, ang ever-present sa kanilang mga poems or written poems is the sense of ominous fate or world, world, a world, yeah, world. And this, um, yung pinaka-element ng kanilang, or pinaka-theme ng kanilang um, literature is all about their strong fate. Na, according to them, that every human life was in the hands of fate. So, we can further discuss this on the next slide. So, here is an example. It is an excerpt from one of the elegiac poems, The Wanderer. The Wanderer is an old English poem preserved only in an anthology known as the Exeter Book, a manuscript dating from the late 10th century. It comes 115 lines, all alliterative verse as is often the case in Anglo-Saxon verse. The composer and compiler are anonymous. So, walang name author. And then, and within the manuscript, the poem is untitled. But then, palaging nandun yun yung theme ng Anglo-Saxon literature, which is their strong faith. So, here, um, hidden wise in soul, with where his heart stings deeply upon this dark some life, this fallen fastness. So, if you are going to study more on analysis of poems, so mom discussed that when we are going to study literature, we always have to do analysis. Yeah. Um. Here, it defects here the the um, parang ano nang Nung writer or nung poet that that 
yung element na about fate na hinayaan niya na lang na ano man nangyayari sa kanya, it's his fate. Ano man, whatever he will going to do pa, to um to escape, he cannot escape his fate. Um then the next slide oh here another example of the most important um literary work in old english literature is the beowulf legend so i know all of you i know all of you that already knows about the beowulf legend because when we are in lower grade level this is already discussed by some of our um literature teacher so the bill of legend it is the most important heroic poetry in old english literature and the story of it is the story of a great pagan warrior renowned for his courage strength and dignity so who is the pagan warrior so the pagan warrior his is the title of the book it's uh, the title of the literary work itself which is bill and then it is an epic when i say an epic it is a long heroic poem that mostly it described the um, um the life of uh, a legendary of uh, yeah, a legend hero and then the anglo-saxon the anglo-saxon the bill of legend is considered as the national epic of england so why does this work is considered as the national epic of the England? Well, it is mainly because this is, this is the first such work to be composed in the English language. And again, the author is unknown. And unknown. So, and then although the versions of the poem were probably cited as early as the 6th century, the text that we have today was composed in the 8th century and not written down until the 11th. And then another fact about the Beowulf legend is it is clearly evident in Beowulf, however, the values of warrior society, especially such values as dignity, bravery, and prowess and battle. So now that you can understand here that old English literature, their theme is always main i know about what their what kind of life what kind of life or what kind of history they has they had now here is an excerpt um i i get an excerpt from the one of the heroic film poems the bewell and Bewell, according to this, and Bewell was ready firm with our Lord's high favor in his own bold courage and strength. So even this is a story of a pagan warrior, it is the Christian, yung writer nito, kasi sinulat siya during Christian ano na, invasion na ng ano. So, um, there is always an element that talks about their faiths to God. So, religious. Ganon. And here is some illustration of Bewell, of the story in the Bewell. So, as you can see, the monster here is named Grendel. Am I correct? Oh, yeah. Grendel. So, he is the, man the monster who devote or people and then the mighty warrior Beowulf is the one who um uh slain slay him okay so um for more um information about the Beowulf I encourage all of you to read this literary work because it's good to read now that we're done with um citing some literary works now let's come to the most um yung most rena uh, most known or renowned poets of question era during the old english literature so we have here sidmon and cinewolf so they are the greatest that um 
worthy to mention in this discussion. So, Sedmon is apparently lived in the 7th century. Okay. Sedmon lived apparently in the 7th century is mentioned in Bedes. His Bedes, Bedes, Bedes history. The poet only authenticated verse consists of the few lines that Bed the recorded called Sidmon hymns. So and then this Sidmon Monian verse is the term used often to identify other early Christian poetry. So yung I know yung style Sidmon nagi siyang um instrument for other um researchers that study language para ma identify yung style now is some poetry if this is uh, from old english or the middle age english Ganun. so i have here another example of sinmon uh, um quote light was first through the lord's word name day musician's bright creation so it is um a quote of Sedmon in his work creation the first day and it was translated by Benjamin Torpe. Now let's come with Senewolf. So how come this Senewolf become famous during that era? So Senewolf was the um, excuse me Marilyn uh, sorry yes. for cutting you. Yeah yes. how many more slides do we have? Um wait long ma'am one, two, three. I tatlo na lang po. Ah, okay, okay. Okay. Continue. Sige, uh, sige, ma'am. Um, Senewolf is big. Um, became famous because he is known for um, scribe, scribing sign his name spelling in out of ruins on four poems that survive today. So, kumbaga bibihira lang nun. It's very rare to have a writer being named kasi mostly anonymous yung mga ano, uh, writers that time. Here is another uh, about the Anglo-Saxon prose before the reign of Alfred, Alfred the Great. So my levy already discuss who is Alfred the Great. All important prose written in the British Isle was composed in Latin. So, and during the, but during the reign of Alfred the Great, those um, literary works, it was translated into the Anglo-Saxon language. So again, Anglo-Saxon is another term for Old English. And then the Max to transcribe these works regarded the vernacular, the language of common people as Bulgar tongue. And so that is why yung old English literature hindi siya masyado mahirap i-analyze compared again to um, other another literary pieces. Now, um, it is just a review of Venerable Betty. Venerable Betty is the greatest of England's Latin scholars. And Alcuin is the Betty successors as the leading English color now for the last slide during alfred the great reigns there is some scholars known in his time so historically usually credit alfred the great with having changed the course of british literature so thank we should thank him for that the spark he gave to the English language was evident and it's more widespread used among scholars after his death. And then one, two of the most known scholars of his time is Alfred and Wolfstein. A monk, Alfred is a monk of Wessex, wrote many works in vernacular, including a series of homilies or sermons based on the Bible stories. And Wolfstein is an archbishop of York also wrote several poems and old English, including a famous speech on the devastation of the of Danish raids. So here is now I am going to end our discussion and thank you for listening. And I want to share you 
this one quote we choose which is it is better never to begin good work than having began it to stop so dito pa lang sa quote na to kay Berry we are both encouraged and discouraged in the same way but then kung mataas ang pride mo syempre you will never uh, you will begin that work that you are going to continue uh, you, you are going to finish that's all and i thank you thank you marlene okay thank you very much to our discussants okay Let's give them a round of applause. Yan. Okay, congratulations to our discussants. And thank you for giving us a very comprehensive discussion. Now, class, the Old English is the term that we use when we refer to the language literature that is spoken and written in England during the rule of the Anglo-Saxons. Okay? And... The Old English is the language and literature of the Anglo-Saxons. It ruled based on other discussions. They also mentioned that they, it, it uh, ruled England from 450 AD to 1066. And if you're going to look at Old English is directly related to Modern English. Why? Because many of the modern words came from Old English. And Old English was first oral, then, then used alphabets in writing on manuscripts. Okay. And um, during the Anglo-Saxons, there was strong belief in faith. So what I'm doing is I'm just uh, summarizing, okay, what they have discussed. Uh, there was a strong belief in faith, um, juxtaposition of the church and pagan worlds, admiration of heroic warriors who prevail in battle and express religious faith and give moral instructions through literature and during that time the genres are oral tradition of literature and poetry is the dominant genre and there were also unique uh, forms of literature which includes sisura and i i got it from the discussions that they had they also had alliteration and you know repetition and some of the authors uh the key literature that they do have they have the b wolf exeter book and the venerable deed um i don't know if it's it could be bead or bd okay it's important to uh to study old english because it shows us where english comes from and how it relates to other language. It tells us about the history, society, and the geography of England. Okay? Now, class, I've in Moodle, I've already uploaded um, information or discussions which you can which you can look uh, for a summary of our discussion today. And I would be uploading more. Um, I would be uploading modules and other activities also under this topic and the activities that you have to do. But for now, um, I would like to congratulate the uh, first group of discussants because they have provided us a very comprehensive discussion and very good. I commend you for that and continue working you, on. Yes. And uh, for the next meeting, kindly prepare our... Uh, next discussions but by the way class i would be posting also activities about some literary pieces for example be wolf so make sure to read it uh, you can search for for it on the internet um the the literary piece or i will also post it so that you will be guided and some of the questions that you have to answer okay do you have any questions none Okay, if there is none, can I ask you to please um, open your camera? I will just take a screenshot of us because, uh, like I said, we need it. Okay. All right. So, Eduardo, I can already see you. Okay. All right. So, ayan, may nagtatawag na sa akin. <laughs> okay. 
Oh my goodness. Ayan. Smile. Okay, one more time. Smile. Okay, it's nice to see all your faces. I'll see you again during our next synchronous meeting. Goodbye. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma